Let's move on to uh, the next talk by Michael uh, Michaelidis. Uh, before his talk, I'm going to present the certificate of the abstract award to him. So, uh, Dr. Michaelidis uh, completed his undergraduate studies in economics and uh, mathematics at Stony Brook University and afterwards received an NIH uh, Intramural Research Award. Uh, upon completion of this training, he was admitted to the Integrative Neuroscience Doctoral Program at Stony Brook University. Uh, the vast majority of his doctoral work was performed at the Radio Tracer chemistry and instrumentation for biological imaging program at uh, Brookhaven National Labor Laboratory. Uh, he has worked on the development of novel behavioral pet imaging methodologies and image analysis techniques. Uh, after his PhD, he joined the Dr. Uh, Yasmin Hurd's Molecular Neuropsychopharmacology Lab here at Mount Sinai, where he has been uh, integrating his experience in uh, behavioral uh, pharmacology and neuroimaging with molecular biology and epigenetics. Uh, Dr. Michaelides uh, has uh, been very co productive, has co-authored over 30 uh, peer-reviewed publications, and his research interests lie in the molecular basis of uh, appetitive drive and mood and uh, motion uh, and the motivational disorders. So his abstract uh, was selected from uh, a total of 23 abstracts in the neural category this year. Um, I hope uh, he can convince you after his talk why having a micropath system is a very valuable uh, is a very valuable research resource. Here we go. Thank you very much, Gordon, and thank everyone for coming. Um, and thank you very much for special thanks to the committee for allowing me to present this work today. Okay, so PET imaging um, utilizes radio tracers. Uh, one such tracer is FDG, which is a glucose analog, and it's administered in subjects which are placed inside a PET scanner. And then, ba and then um, the distribution of the radio tracer is basically uh, imaged. And here you can see the brain, and this is glucose uptake in the brain. And FDG is used as a marker of uh, neuronal activity. There are uh, several different types of PET scanners. So there are PET scanners for human use, for small animals such as rats and mice. And recently there have also been PET scanners that could be mounted on the head of a rat and allow the animal to move around freely. This is the distribution of FDG in a human. And this is the distribution of FDG in a rat. And you can see that it's very uh, similar. So FDG is a very translational radio tracer. So you can see the brain, the heart, the stomach, and the bladder. And these same regions are observed in the rat as well. So the way FDG works is it enters the cell, just like glucose does. And it gets phosphorylated, just like glucose does. But because it has this isotope here, it can't further uh, get metabolized. And it gets trapped inside the cell. And what this allows uh, scientists to do is administer it into a, a rat. And uh, depending on the route of administration, whether it's intravenous or intraperitoneal, <coughs> it'll reach uh, the brain and achieve steady uh, levels uh, sooner rather than, than later. And basically what this enables one to do is inject it into the rat, uh, have the, the, the rat exposed to a specific behavioral context or a pharmacological manipulation, and during this time, FDG will go into cells that uh, are more active, and less FDG will go into cells that are less active. Uh, when FDG stabilizes, you can anesthetize the animal, place it inside the scanner, and basically obtain a snapshot of brain activity during this, this time period. Um, what happens when, FD, when the F18 isotope decays, uh, FDG can become metabolized and uh, can exit the cell. And what this allows one to do is uh, image the same animal over and over. Here, uh, so one of the other technologies we've recently developed, and you can see here there's a rat uh, with its whiskers being stimulated. So we anesthetize rats and we place them inside the scanner, and then here uh, you can see that uh, we manipulated the whiskers. 
and we injected the animals with FDG, and we did this intravenously. And what we found, and we collected data dynamically, and the data was binned in one-minute intervals. And we were able to look to um, observe brain activation in specific brain areas, uh, such as here the retrosplenial cortex, uh, some of the sensory cortex, and thalamic nuclei. And these actually, it's very interesting because these are uh, the exact same areas that have been previously shown to map the anatomical circuits associated with the whisker motor cortex. And so the importance here is that we have a time-dependent brain functional response. And we call this uh, DICE for dynamic connectivity estimation. Now one of the major challenges, uh, so the brain is, is it has different regions and it's also, it also expresses different cell types in these regions. And it's a very heterogeneous organ. And one of the major challenges in neuroscience is to understand how brain cells work in concert to regulate behavior, physiology, and metabolism. And this is an example here of these two pathways, the direct and the indirect striatal pathways. And you can see that they project to different uh, downstream targets and they encode different but synergistic behaviors. And so one approach that allows, uh, has been allowing scientists to, to, to probe the differences in uh, the, the, the cell type contribution to behavior is called DRED, and this stands for designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. And this technology utilizes a designer ligand called CNO, which uh, does not bind or activate endogenous muscarinic receptors. In fact, it doesn't seem to have any target. Um, however, it does bind and activates uh, mutated human muscarinic receptors. And these receptors are insensitive to endogenous acetylcholine, but um, which still activates the muscarinic receptors. And there, so one of these uh, designer receptors, one of these dreads, uh, is the HM3DQ, and this specifically, when activated by CNO, acts via the GQ signaling pathway. But there are other mutated receptors, such as the HM4DI and the RM3DS, which, uh, when bound and activated by CNO, function via the GI and the GS intracellular signaling pathways. So this approach allows one to look at the contribution of specific intracellular signaling pathways within distinct cell types in distinct regions of the brain. And it has been applied in, um, in many species, and it, it seems to have translational value as well, but hasn't obviously been applied in humans. Um, this technology allows the remote control of neural activity. You can target regions in uh, specific cells. As I said, you can look at intracellular signaling specificity. It's highly longitudinal. It's very reproducible. One can conduct concurrent behavioral and physiological assessments. And it's, minim it's minimally invasive. Uh, there are also some transgenics that express these receptors constitutively in specific cell types. And it also allows for multiple simultaneous targeting, and CNO is orally bioavailable. And so what we did is we combined um, behavioral imaging with FDG and MicroPET, which enables one to look at map behavior to neurochemistry, with uh, DREAD, which enables one to manipulate neurochemistry and behavior. And we call this approach DREAD-assisted metabolic mapping, or DREAM for short. And first we wanted to apply this uh, using our dynamic connectivity estimation uh, technique to probe the uh, functional anatomy associated with uh, modulating the, these two pathways here that I showed you previously. So we um, injected rats into the nucleus accumbens shell, as you can see here, in one hemisphere, uh, and we expressed the uh, inhibitory dread uh, in, specific, in these two specific cell types that project to different parts of the brain. And we used a viral uh, mediated um, delivery mechanism. And so the animals were anesthetized, uh, they were placed on the scanner, they were injected with CNO or vehicle, so they were scanned twice, uh, and then with FDG and scanning was collected dynamically. And here you can see, uh, so this is the brain functional ana anatomy in response to um, inhibiting the direct pathway, and this is the brain functional anatomy, anatomy in re response to inhibiting the indirect pathway. And uh, you can see the time-dependent recruitment of areas throughout the brain um, that, are, that are basically being activated or inhibited. And red is basically, here it shows increased glucose uptake and blue is indicative of decreased uh, glucose uptake. And 
what you can see is in the areas where these uh, neurons here specifically project, such as the midbrain, there is an immediate increase in activity. And areas where these neurons uh, directly project at one minute, there's a decrease in activity. And here you can see the, uh, the Paxinos atlas is showing the actual anatomy. And uh, when you look at that schematic before, you can see very nicely that uh, there is a large uh, inhibition here along the ventral part and an activation along the dorsal, which fits the model. So next we wanted to see if, if we can obtain quantitative measures using this, this, this technique. Um, and so we looked at this area here, the midbrain, which dissociates these two uh, neuronal populations in terms of its direct targeting. And um, we defined specific um, uh, stereotactic locations, and we extracted the quantitative data from, from the, the, uh, the maps. And here you can see, uh, similar with the maps that I showed you before, that at one minute, when, the, when we uh, inhibited the direct pathway, there is an increase in FDG uptake, whereas in 30 minutes, there is a significant decrease in FDG uptake. Looking at the indirect pathway, which does not project here directly, there is no significant effect. And we also validated this using CFOS, immunostaining. So CFOS is a marker of neuronal activity. And you can see here in the, in the nucleus where the direct pathway neurons directly project, there is decreased activity after one hour, which fits with our in vivo uh, measures. Another uh, really interesting attribute of this technique is its profound special, spatial resolution. So here, this is uh, just uh, one of the slices in the coronal plane. When we activate and we inhibit the direct pathway neurons, uh, this is an increase in glucose uptake. When we inhibit the indirect pathway neurons, this is a decrease in glucose uptake. So these are in two di distinct groups of animals. But when you overlay these, you can see that they don't overlay. They actually seem to fit like a puzzle. And this is very interesting because these two uh, uh, neurons are overlapping in the specific region that we're targeting, and they uh, regulate in opposite but synergistic ways behavior. And so it's really interesting how we can see this type of puzzle uh, emerging when we specifically manipulate one versus the other. So the next step we wanted to do is apply this technique to our behavioral imaging methods that we and others have developed. And so what we did is we took these same rats, uh, we injected them with CNO or vehicle, and uh, they were placed in an open field chamber. So this is basically a, a box that monitors their, their motor activity. <clears throat> then they were injected with FDG, placed back into the same box for 30 minutes, then anesthetized and scanned. And so we were able to basically uh, see the idea was to see the, the brain functional responses during this time period. So looking at the behavior first, what we observed was that when we ipsilaterally uh, inhibited the activity of the direct pathway neurons, the animals couldn't turn to the right. Whereas when we did the same manipulation to the indirect pathway neurons, the animals turned more to the right. We also found that uh, direct pathway neuron inhibition, so these animals couldn't make clockwise turns around the arena. And you can see this here, it's a very, very strong effect. We didn't see this type of effect when we inhibited the, the other neuronal subtype. But what was very interesting is the, uh, some of the imaging data that, that we collected while the animals were being exposed to this paradigm. And so one example here is the motor cortex. So you can see that in the hemisphere that we uh, inhibited the, the, the direct pathway neurons, we saw an increased uh, FDG uptake in the motor cortex. And the motor cortex controls the contralateral side of the body. So this would be indicative of increased activity in the left side, in, in the left side of the body. And that's exactly what we saw here. Whereas when we induced this manipulation here, the other neuronal sub, uh, subtype, we saw a decrease in uptake. And so a decrease in the right motor cortex would translate to a decrease in the left uh, motor responses. And that's exactly what we see here. So what this is showing you is that we can map uh, brain activity onto behavior when we manipulate specific cell types. And here you can see the, the maps uh, when we, uh, that correspond to each manipulation. Um, so you saw, we saw contralateral insula activation and then a majority on the ipsilateral side, especially in the ventral pallidum, medial amygdala, and enterrhinal cortex. 
and the direct pathway inhibition recruited mainly limbic areas. The other manipulation, you can see we also have some decreases in FDG uptake, and this uh, engaged mostly sensory motor um, regions. One of the really interesting findings here was the recruitment of the hippocampus, the right hippocampus, and you can actually see the fornix here. And here I have a three-dimensional rendering of that activation, and you can see it's very clearly outlined. So this is the, the rat hippocampus here. So inhibiting these neurons produces a very strong activation in the hippocampus, and this is very intriguing because uh, studies that have looked at behavior after similar types of manipulations in these neurons show that they um, show that it's related to aversive memory formation. And this is also the quantitative data here showing that you can quantify these responses and not just obtain maps. And so to summarize, an anesthetized rat dream enables cell-specific, quantitative, longitudinal, whole brain time-dependent functional mapping of anatomically relevant pathways. And that's because the animals are anesthetized, so there's no behavior. But in freely moving rats, when you use these type of behavioral imaging methods, DREAM enables cell-specific quantitative longitudinal whole brain functional circuit mapping that is behaviorally relevant. And presumably this differs based on the behavioral context. So some future things that uh, we would like to do and are actually currently working on is, so DREAM has the capacity of being completely non-invasive. So if you use one of these tra new transgenic mice or uh, pretty soon there will be transgenic rats that express these recept receptors in specific cell types, then all, all the animal would experience would be an IP or an IV injection of the tracer. Um, one can also look at neurotransmitter signaling. So the same type of imaging methodologies that we use for FDG here, we've used for other tracers like carbon-11 raclopride. And you can manipulate specific cell types and see if you get displacement of, of these types of signals and infer on receptor neurotransmitter interactions. And finally, uh, one of the final things that this uh, technology uh, presumably allows is that this time-dependent response here can also be translated into a, a behavioral model. If, if one uses uh, uh, machines like this, the rat cap, which enable the animal to f uh, freely move around. And with, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Michael, for talking about your dream. Uh, this talk is uh, open for question. Okay. I have a quick question. Uh, uh, do you envision this uh, to move uh, to be used in larger animal and uh, potentially in primates? Um, yes, I believe uh, some. Sp Scientists are currently using this in, in primates, and, um, and the platform is actually highly translational. Obviously not now, but uh, because CNO is orally bioavailable, um, it represents a perfect uh, model to be translated to humans. Because, you know, if gene therapy is successful, obviously, you can express these receptors in specific cell types, and then a ligand like CNO can be taken just like a pill, and then you can activate specific cell types remotely. Uh, so instead of taking a drug that basically has, will have multiple targets in the CNS or in the periphery, you'd be able to isolate um, the effects of your, of your treatment. Um, but yeah, and so my impression is that there are many, not my impression, I know that there are people working on this on primates and com want to combine it with imaging. But I don't think anyone has, has done this yet. Thank you. So this concludes this session.